Hello and welcome to The Blueprint by Ballymore, the podcast that looks at how we can build better cities, speaking to urban innovators from around the world. I'm your host, journalist and broadcaster Jonathan Openshaw, and in this final episode of the series, we'll be looking into the transportation systems that get our cities moving. If buildings are the bones of a city and people are its lifeblood, then transport links are the veins and arteries. Although architectural icons such as the Eiffel Tower, Statue of Liberty and Big Ben are often used as visual shorthand for a city, no less iconic are its unique forms of transport. Just imagine London without its red buses, black cabs and sprawling tube. A city's transport system quite literally puts it on the map. We all know the horrors of a transport system gone wrong, however. Hours of gridlock traffic or a rush hour train so packed that commuters have to slot together like a game of Tetris. But when transport works well, it can not only improve your day, but also transform your entire experience of a place. The recent pandemic has also reminded us just how reliant our globalised economy is on being able to interact seamlessly. Without people being able to move freely, many businesses have quite literally ground to a stop. So how can we design mobility systems that are ready for the challenges of the 21st century? Well, in this episode, I'll be speaking to Paul Priestman, co-founder and director of mobility design experts Priestman Good, about the core importance of transport. Transport defines cities. You, know, you go to New York and you go in the yellow taxi or you go to San Francisco and you go on the tram. And I think modern transport, again, is, is a reason that you travel to a city. It, it's in a part of the enjoyment. It's the look and the feel and the character of it. I'll be asking Kwame Nyaning, Chief Experience Officer of Arrival, for his vision of a more sustainable transportation system of the future. Our vehicles should be well-mannered, well-behaved citizens within a very you know, diverse and complex environment that contribute in positive ways to the quality of life in the, in the places that, that we exist. And with Ballymore's new development of Mill Harbour situated on London's long-awaited crossrail, we asked the chief curator of New London Architecture, Peter Murray, about the impact that new rail routes can have on a city's landscape. The delivery of transport is absolutely uh, vital. And of course, you know, the, the growth of suburbia was... Uh, was because of the spread of the underground system out into uh, suburban areas. A good transportation system is a bit like a great recipe or a beautiful piece of music. You need lots of complementary elements working in harmony for it to really sing. From tubes to buses, cars to bikes, it's a complex balance to strike, however, and no one knows this better than Paul Priestman, the acclaimed industrial designer who co-founded Priestman Good and has shaped some of the most innovative transport designs of our age, from the Hyperloop system to London's new tube and the Hong Kong Metro. I started off by asking him how public transport can make or break your experience of a city. When we're designing high-speed trains around the world, they, are, they, they define the look and feel of a, of a, of a country. If you, if you um, envisage um, Japan, um, a, an image may be the uh, bullet train, the Shinkansen, in front of Mount Fuji. And so it's public transport defining character of a country, and that is a really interesting area of design. Um, because it's obviously to do with, with cultural differences, but also uh, embodying, uh, embodying character into, into the things we're designing. So transport's clearly completely key uh, to the character of a place, um, to our kind of t- experience of it as well. But what about the nuts and bolts of how a city actually functions? What role does mobility play in the overall success of a city? Yeah, mobility, I think, is, is absolutely critical. And I think what, what we're seeing is... is is an interesting change that's happening in 2020, particularly the, the balance between public and private transport. And I th- this is an area that we work in quite a lot, so obviously designing metros. But I think there is this sort of growing, I hope, a growing understanding that, that cycling and walking and personal forms of transport is now becoming a, a vital part of a sort of transport infrastructure, when previously it'd be seen as sort of a marginal few people on bikes and people walking, but it wasn't really taken seriously as, as part of the system. And 
you know, we've had uh, ideas like walk lines where, we, in effect, you're building a tram line through a city, but without the trams. It's got the stations where you can stop, but that allows you to cycle and walk efficiently through a city at long distance because a lot of the metros and buses are clogged up by people doing one or two stops. So if you can encourage them to actually walk a little bit further, um, there's obviously the health benefit, um, but also uh, it's quicker and you don't have to build as much stuff um, because cities are getting more and more clogged up. Um, and if you see what's happened in New York with the, with the licensing of uh, electric scooters and it's happening in more cities, um, streets being closed and will they remain closed? Um, and I think that's really interesting because it's, it is actually enhancing cities and making them more enjoyable places to live. You know, I, I really do think we need to start looking at what we've got. Um, I, I, I've always said this, I think it's really interesting. You can stand on a motorway bridge and you, cars are flying underneath you every five seconds or every split second. Um, and then you stand on a railway bridge and, and it's, an, it, you know, you go, oh, look, there's a train. Um, so what, you know, that, 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 what we've got isn't being used more effect, uh, effectively. So, you know, boring things like signalling and control of trains to allow more trains to, or vehicles to use that system that we've got. So it is actually having to think about things like that and, and, and easing them into, into modernity, I think. There's, there's a, a concept which, which um, <clears throat> is an idea that I had, which we, we, we're just beginning to sort of talk about and, and show people, which is called Metro Freight. And the idea here is that at the moment, I mean, New York gets 1.5 million deliveries a day in that city, in that space. And that's all um, road-based. And that is where the, the, the traffic congestion, pollution and problems arise. So why can't we use the existing infrastructure, the metro system, to, well, most metro um, systems go to airports or ports or other forms of, of transport. So why can't we use that system to actually deliver goods onto those, that system? It pops up in a metro station and then it's locally delivered. Either it's delivered at night or with special vehicles. But then the whole idea is that then those, those metro stations are reinvented into these sort of almost global marketplaces, um, global markets, um, where you can go and pick up goods or exchange goods and send them back if necessary. But it's all not using the road system. And, um, you know, is this the new high streets? You have pop-up shops where you can buy your, your latest electrical gadget, but with, from the guy that you trust and it can help you work it out and then, you know, goods pop out of the ground. But it's not clogging up the, the, the infrastructure. Um, I mean, the, the, the roads and system uh, and, and things. So uh, if we can just, it's, it's like rethinking about what we've got in a, in a, in a, in a more um, relevant way, I think. So we clearly need to rethink what we've got, kind of look at what we're working with and how we can use it better. But do you think we also need to rethink our whole approach to the commute, this idea of the commute being this kind of dead time in the day, this wasted time? And could we actually kind of look at different modes of transport and see how it can be become really kind of active time? Uh, you know, whether that's working or health or education, um, could it be this space that we kind of rethink as an, as an extra um, activity space of our day? Yeah, I think it's, to be cynical, you know, tell someone, you know, in rush hour sitting on a metro train in a city saying you're gonna have more space to work and they'll laugh. But in certain situations, um, uh, when you're traveling on intercity trains or, or um, longer distance, I think it's definitely uh, feasible. Um, and, then, and again, with this sort of more vehicles on demand, where um, you, you will have more, uh, less people, but on, on, on smaller vehicles, and that is all possible. And, um, and, and this takes you on to another thought, it's, it's like, what's the rush? You know, if you're working, then, then why don't you take the slow train? Why don't you take the picturesque route? Um, and that all helps the pressure on, on, on the, this sort of trying to get people quickly from one place to another, which, which is causing overcrowding. Um, you know, I think, I think the, the, the thing about design, you can dream, can't you? I mean, if no one's dreaming, then we're not going to get there. So I think you have to, you have to think big and, and, and um, try and, and, and really think uh, a different way. Um, almost naively, because I think some, some of the, the best ideas are the naive ideas and the obvious questions you've got to ask um, and, and try and push those.
That was Paul Priestman, co-founder and director of Priestman Good, on the importance of dreaming when it comes to designing the transportation system of the future. Now, we touched on that move towards more sustainable transportation there, and as well-being becomes an increasing concern for our megacities, this is one of the major challenges that needs tackling. Well, it's also one of the core focus points at Mill Harbour, as we explored in previous episodes about sustainable and health-boosting design. But the development also has extensive cycleways and vast bike storage, as project architect Glenn Howells explains. Increasingly, cycling will be important Uh, for cities such as London. And what we want to do is not just provide compliant and decent cycle facilities. What we want to do is do exceptional cycle facilities. So what we've been looking at is how what the route is in for cyclists, how they can maintain and uh, clean the the bikes, uh, how they can be totally secure, but also do that in an area which is generous, where people can then... um, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe even some of the repair facilities that we're looking to do are then brought into the building as well. And so the whole sort of maintenance of the cycling can also be dealt with as well as, a, as, well as the storage of the bicycles. And then also thinking about then elegant and uh, generous sort of routes from these facilities throughout going, going then to the homes. The humble bicycle may date back to the early 1800s, but the renewed move towards pedal-powered cities is nonetheless an exciting one that could completely transform our urban experience around the world. For a true green revolution, however, we need to also leverage smart tech to create more sustainable solutions, and that's exactly what British-based mobility company Arrival is leading the way on. I spoke to their chief experience officer, Kwame Nyaning, about what comes next and started off by asking him how he wants to redesign our experience of public transport. So, you know, with a a lot of other aspects of the built environment and of the uh, kind of commercial world, you're seeing things that are more usable, that are more uh, human-centered and uh, empathetic uh, and you know, Arrival, I think, first and foremost, considers itself more as a technology company than as a, a, a mobility company or an electric vehicle company. And as a technology company, we approach everything from a user-centric or a human-centric perspective. So that's why the environments that we're developing and that we're designing are crafted in a way that is, is, is intended to put people at ease is intended to be um, more efficient. And so we took spent a lot of time thinking about, well, what, what should, you know, like typically you, you're on a bus, you, you press a bell, there's like a little blue button, square button, and you press it and it makes a dinging sound. And, you know, you there, there's not a lot of feedback other than that, than that ding. And uh, sometimes you have to press it multiple times because the bus driver hasn't, registered that that they've that they've heard the ding so what were some ways that, that we could we could approach that that bell push and so we you know put a lot of time and energy and effort into it and if you see our bell push on on our bus which is a uh, capacitive touch pad that has a light on it um, that gives direct physical feedback and makes a really pleasant sound and as soon as that bell push is is pressed there's digital screens with within on on the bus that indicate um, through the length of the bus that the, the stop has been requested on the the interface that the driver has in the HMI. There's a very clear indication that a stop has been requested. And that that experience and that level of feedback is very, very positive. But then within a COVID situation, because the buses are connected and because we recognize that many people will have access to, you know, have to have mobile phones, we've also made it possible that you can press that 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 bus stop function within a, within a mobile device. So you no longer have to touch directly touch it in, in order to indicate your stop. And then when the bus does a, when a bus arrives at a stop, because of this, the digital signage on the exterior of the of, of the of the bus, we can indicate where people need to get on and where people need to get off based on um, where the concentration of, of exiting passengers um, are, are going to be. So we're able to um, orchestrate people entering and exiting the bus in a way that they're no longer having to 
kind of brush up against each other as much or, or, or sort of, you know, kind of come into contact with each other as much. So those types of little design solutions um, are, 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 are things that they sort of cumulatively add up to present a, a, a more positive experiences. Those are some really powerful examples of how um, a smart, relatively simple use of tech can totally transform our experience of transport, um, and especially in these times of kind of um, heightened public health awareness. But looking at the bigger picture, what is Arrival's overall vision for the future of mobility? So it's, it's, it's about creating a more pleasant and more human environment for, for people with, with, within, within cities. And... We feel that by making vehicles that cost the same as an internal combustion engine and provide a enhanced experience that you remove a lot of the barriers that would normally be in place when a large bus operator is beginning to think about you know, replacing their internal combustion engine fleet with an electric fleet, which usually is something that's seen as a, there's a, a premium on, on electric vehicles. So if you remove that, it becomes a lot easier then to uh, decide and make that purchase decision um, to introduce electric vehicles into your fleet. And then the effectiveness of those electric vehicles, because they're connected and interconnected, is increased and you're even more motivated to introduce more electric vehicles into that into that ecosystem. And we also you know, want to work with city planners and city administrators and municipal bodies to think about what are, what's the infrastructure that needs to be put in place to, to support this vision of zero carbon future and to really begin to put in place not just the charging infrastructure and the sort of increasing bus lanes and, and things like that, but what are some new models of transportation usage that can be introduced that provide a more flexible and a more adaptable set of uh, solutions so that, again, people wanting to get from point A to point B aren't facing the types of hurdles that, that they're facing now. So as with autonomous vehicles, the kind of much hyped um, self-driving vehicles, it feels like technology is getting there now uh, for sustainable transport. Um, but the real challenge is integrating it into these hu hugely complicated pre-existing transport systems that we have, these kind of labyrinthine systems. Do you think that working with existing stakeholders is key to the future, future success of Arrival? A lot of times in the past, you know, like companies like Uber and Lyft, have sort of imposed themselves on the urban environment. And in places like New York or, or other large cities, they've introduced complexity in ways that um, have crippled the city or have, have been you know, sort of detrimental to the development of, um, of positive kind of systems. And that's, that's something that we've noticed and that's something that, that we're, we're very much you know, planning not to do is yes, we have a better product and yes, it's human centered, but we also realize that the way to ensure its success and its, its, its efficiency and effectiveness within a shared environment is to engage with the people in that environment and the, the, the people that are making the policy decisions and the regulatory kind of frameworks that are governing and guiding these places in order to, for us as a rival, to introduce vehicles, both the van and the bus and any other vehicle that we introduce that can be positive, like good citizens, right? Like, 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 like our, our vehicles should be well-mannered, well-behaved citizens within a very you know, diverse and complex environment that contribute in positive ways to the quality of life. In the, in the places that, that we exist. That was Kwame Nyaning, Chief Experience Officer at Arrival, talking about his vision for clean transportation that makes a more meaningful contribution to the health of cities. Now, like any major city, London has faced historic challenges when it came to transportation, with overloaded trains and diesel splurging taxis. But this has changed dramatically in recent years. 
Indeed, the city was recently identified by Deloitte as a global leader in their annual mobility index, highlighting the mix of vision, innovation and investment that is changing the capital's infrastructure. Mill Harbour is set to benefit from these changes, with the long-awaited crossrail opening on its doorstep and heavy investment in nearby city airports cementing its international ties. One man who is very familiar with the complexities of London mobility planning is Peter Murray, curator-in-chief of New London Architecture, the organisation that specialises in bringing together the many planners, politicians and other urban experts that define the capital's infrastructure. I began by asking Peter about the dramatic impact that new connections can have on London's neighbourhoods. I think the links into public transport generally, and uh, you've only got to look at the effects of the overground rail, which was delivered in, what, I think, 2006, uh, a policy uh, generated by Ken Livingstone when, when he was mayor, might say connecting up uh, different parts of overground rail to create, uh, a, again, a, a, a an orbital route. And that has really had major impact on places like Dalston and Peckham and their connections into other parts of the areas, both in terms of regenerating local economies, but actually making access to jobs for people living in those areas uh, that much more easily. So, yes, I think that absolutely the delivery of transport is absolutely uh, vital. And of course, uh, you know, the, the growth of suburbia was uh, and Metroland uh, was because of the spread of the underground system out into uh, suburban areas. I look back to uh, one of the cities which had really interesting strategies in terms of delivering improved walking and cycling infrastructure is New York, which under the Bloomberg administration delivered a lot of what is called, you know, sort of paint and pots uh, infrastructure where they painted new cycle routes on the road, uh, delivered temporary landscaping to create some sort of segregated routes. And uh, over one weekend, they, uh, they they closed off Times Square and turned it from being uh, one of the most hideous junctions anywhere in the world into a great space for people to congregate, pedestrians to walk around, cyclists to cycle through. And uh, you know, after using that for a year or, or so, and people realised that it was so much better than ever was, and all the criticisms of uh, closing off the, the streets and so on uh, disappeared, and people now would not think of going back to what it was like in the old days. One of the other th things that has been a part of the changes taking place are uh, low traffic neighbourhoods. Low traffic neighbourhoods, they've been around as an idea for a, a, a long time. In the, in the 1970s, there were parts of Islington, uh, places like that, which did have uh, low traffic neighbourhood infrastructure put into them, restricting movement through streets, uh, reducing rat running through residential neighbourhoods. And uh, this, is, this is coming back again as an idea and I think is uh, going to be popular in a lot of areas. That shift towards more localised neighbourhoods um, is definitely a super interesting one. Um, these kind of vibrant mixed use areas where you've got all amenities on your doorstep. And that's definitely one of the core ideas um, at Mill Harbour, certainly. But I think it's clear that people still need to move around cities. Um, certain things just can't be localised. Um, so the opening of major transportation routes, um, such as the long later Crossrail or the Elizabeth Line, as it's now called, that's going to kind of completely change our axis of London, our experience of the city. What do you think its impact is going to be? Well, the Elizabeth Line has already started to have a pretty major impact on the way we see large parts of London and I would say the most significant of those is probably Thamesmead and uh, you know I'm old enough to remember when Thamesmead was first developed in the 1970s and it was a, a shining uh, sort of modern idea of a new town on the edge of London which gradually over the years became more and more dismal uh, as a place to live and that was largely because it didn't have decent communications. It was very difficult for people not only to get there, but people living there. It was expensive to get to jobs, to get out of there. 
and it gradually became a, a, a sink estate. So like all major cities, um, London's been heavily disrupted by the pandemic um, in recent months. Um, and hopefully, you know, this is going to be a one-off event. There will be a vaccine. But it feels like there has been a shift in public discourse and there's been a shift in our ideas around um, public health and safety um, with implications for future planning. What do you think the long-term impact's going to be? Do you think we're moving into a era of new normal and how can we kind of take learnings from the last few months and turn them into really positive planning measures? What we need is a sort of joint review of where where we go from here. I think that uh, major crises like this have always, you know, throughout history, had an impact on the way that uh, the city is shaped. And if you look back at the Great Fire and, and, and the plague of uh, 1665, you know, that led to uh, people moving out of the city of London, redevelopment of the city of London itself, but it led to the uh, development of, I'd say, healthier places in the West End and uh, uh, around the periphery of the square mile. And you know, what we need to start trying to think uh, about what uh, the overall impact will be of uh, this current pandemic, potentially future pandemics. I mean, it, it, are, are we entering an era of uh, pandemics and we need to at least we need to make sure that we're better prepared for the next one than we are were for this one. Now, one of the things we need to think is, uh, will the fact that people are commuting less because they're working more at home, uh, will this more focus on the local uh, make a difference to the infrastructure we need? And maybe we need to relook at uh, what the, the sort of shape of uh, new communication should be, particularly in the light of changing technology in the way we get around town. We don't hear quite so much talk about autonomous vehicles alone, but obviously more electric, less polluting vehicles. But uh, you know, the, the way we move is is definitely changing. And I would say that after things settle down a bit, we really need to start studying whether we need the sort of infrastructure we have planned at the moment or whether we're looking at a, a really new way of doing stuff. That was Peter Murray of New London Architecture looking at the future of the capital's mobility planning. And that's also all we have time for this week. It brings us to the end of our first series of The Blueprint by Ballymore, celebrating the launch of London's new urban village, Mill Harbour. It's been a packed six episodes where we've tackled the big issues of urban planning today, from health to design, culture to work, mobility to sustainability. We've spoken to some of the biggest names in their industry, as well as innovative upstarts set to change the game when it comes to our experience of the cities around us. If you want to hear more about urban innovation, please do like and subscribe to the podcast on your provider. And of course, we'd love it if you shared with your family and friends. You can find more details about all of our episodes and about Ballymore's new development at Mill Harbour itself in the show notes that accompany this episode. I've been your host, Jonathan Openshaw, and thanks again for tuning in. Hold up. 